this Telet Centurion webinar, Defining Solution Requirements, Your Key to Better IoT Project Management. I'm Amanda Flink, the Head of Global Events here at Telet, and I'll be moderating today's event. And now let's quickly get to know our speakers. To explain this topic today, I'm pleased to be joined by two speakers. First, Charlie Williams, VP IoT Solution Sales at Telet Centurion. And second, Rami Moran, VP IoT Solutions R&D at Telet Centurion. Now, just before I hand it over to Charlie to start our presentation, I have a few quick reminders. I would like to remind our audience that we'll have time to answer some questions at the end of the presentation. Simply submit a question by posting in the questions box located near the bottom of your screen. Also, be sure to check out the resources section for some additional information. Um, there you can find today's slide deck and some other resources. And finally, we will send out the replay link to all attendees at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, and with that, Charlie, I will hand it over to you to start our presentation. Thank you, Amanda. Let's jump into the details. So when you look at global IoT, it's massive. How, how do you launch 75 billion connected devices? You know, how is there so much money, nearly a trillion dollars uh, spent on the size of the market by next year without being successful? Part of the process is very streamlined, but let's talk about what makes that a reality for most of our customers. Let's talk about why most IoT projects fail. Many times it has nothing to do with the competence of a design team or the expertise to meet the requirements or the ability to meet timelines for launching. Oftentimes it's really what are the goals of the project? What are we trying to accomplish here? What are we trying from a business perspective to deliver to our customer bases? And without that clear understanding, it's really difficult to hit the target time after time after time. So we have a couple of different things we want to talk about in terms of how do we become successful when it comes to deploying an IoT project within our team, the Telet IoT Solutions Group. A couple of key tips and best practices here as we like to cover, and this is very wide, but also meant to capture as many of the details as is possible. So first of all, tools. How are we going to track these needs? How are we going to communicate to our client? And how are we going to actually help them understand the case, the cadence and the pace of the project. That's step one. What are, the, what are they trying to accomplish? When we work with our partners, many times they are the expert of their domain. We're the backbone of the technical capability bringing that realization to market for them. What are they trying to solve? What do they want to deliver to their customers? And understanding, you know, how do I do this successfully by putting myself in their shoes? If I'm delivering this to my customers, much the way we do at IoT Solutions, how am I actually, you know, providing this from a completely different vertical? Next is, you know, what are, how are they working today? Is their platform already established? Do they already have tools in place? Are they already using solutions today or is this brand new for them? That often will create a fork in the road where we decide we have to take one uh, approach versus another. And the reason for that is very clear. If they're already operating as a, a business and they have a platform or if they have a system that their customer base is already using, they don't want to start over. You don't want to retrain your team. You don't want to retrain customers to use your tools and to make best use of your service. So we have to fall into that, you know, uh, workflow for them. Otherwise, their customers may get alienated and go work with another partner, which is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do by putting this solution together. Um, number four. Identifying functional or non-functional requirements. Uh, what is the use? What are the business rules? The user stories. Like we want to enhance that further. Like beyond the business process, what are the rules? How are we actually engaging with the data? How are we engaging with the customer? And how are we moving this through to the forefront of the market? Um, step five is always, always, always verify with the customer. Is this what you're thinking about for this particular project? Many times when you see requirements, even if a customer delivers a perfectly beautiful product requirements document, how we interpret what they're trying to accomplish and how they actually meant it to be can be two separate things. And the way you do that is you need to evaluate and sign off. And the reason for that is they've been doing this for some time or this is their core competency and we're coming in as an extension of their team, you know, providing that technical capability to, you know, realize what they're trying to put together. But 
there's oftentimes it can be very different interpretations about what requirements are. So always verify with the client, make sure they sign off on it, make sure they're comfortable with how this works. Because the reality is at the end of the day, they're going to take ownership of this product. They're going to move it forward into the market as if it was wholly created on their own. And in that way, we want the customers to be very, very happy with it because the expectation is we want to have repeat business with our partners to continue to work with them over time. Step six, <clears throat> it goes without saying, always encourage the feedback. We want to get as much information from the customers they're willing and comfortable sharing. Without that, we're only handicapping ourselves to you know, being successful when working with this project. At the IoT Solutions Group, our purpose for existing is to bring these products to market for a customer. So we need to be ingrained with you. We need to be at the ground level with you. We need to understand what their um, requirements are to be successful. Without that, it's really difficult to, you know, guess where we want to be with a particular project. And, you know, when we guess, many times you have a 50-50 chance of getting it right or wrong, and we always want to do it the right way by our customers. So the reality is we always want to be it, it encourage that feedback, you get the feedback, interpret the feedback, and move it forward depending on the expectations set forth by the customer. Tip seven, documentation. This can be anything from meeting minutes to revisions in uh, projects to scopes to proposals. Uh, many times in the IoT Solutions Group, we focus on following a change order or change request format because that's how we track changes over the time. And that also will have a ripple effect on our scheduling and things like that, which is why we want to go back to step two, step three, and understand more and more about the customer's business. Because we want as little interruption to the project pro process as is possible. And the way we go about that is to document everything that we've done in, in key decisions. So if we provide a customer with a fork in the road, we can do A or B, and they choose B. We want to document that and have it for analysis later such that when we move further down the process, if we ever have any questions about, well, why did we do this with this particular project, we have it documented and we can pull it and discuss, you know, the, the decision made at the time and the data used to make that decision. And last but not least, from a best practices perspective is to just to iterate, um, you know, from the time the project launches, from the time the project goes through engineering cycles, <clears throat> after it's been in the market for a couple of years, don't be afraid to iterate. Um, from a project perspective, you know, once we launch, we're mostly in maintenance mode uh, from a hardware perspective uh, with some changes in firmware over time. The realistic uh, outcome is there's always going to be changes to the cellular network, to requirement, to operator requirement, to the customer wanting to launch into a new market. That's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing, and it shows growth and progression from their own business. But the reality is we want to you know, monitor those, document those, and move them forward based on the expectation the customer may have about how is this project going to continue to work three years, five years, seven years into its life cycle, and then how do we as Telet IoT Solutions support them in maximizing the project that we started with them many times years before uh, for their modern business needs. If you look at the project management stages, there's basically five uh, phases here for our discussion. It's essentially project conception, you know, when we're thinking about doing a project, and then it's defining that project. It's what is the project, how does it work, you know, how are customers going to use it, those user stories, those business cases, you know, what is it meant to justify, how is it justified, how do we move it forward with uh, our own business unit uh, with the customer. And then there's execution. This is where projects spend a lot of time, especially when you're talking about custom IoT solutions. The reason for that is many times the customer is doing this either for the first time or the hundredth time. Regardless of that fact, we're always faith focused on the same core competencies when it comes to developing a project from end to end. And then how do we actually, you know, measure that or, you know, what KPIs, you know, how are we, you know, monitoring, are we doing a good job? And a lot of that comes from the project performance and control, understanding how the project is moving through its life cycle, through the development cycle, through its um, own, you know, timing throughout the market and, and, and market timing in terms of launching versus scaling. And then last but not least, is of course, the project launch. You know, how are we managing this from 
a customer expectation. Are we on target? Are we able to provide the cost benefit analysis that they're looking for based on the decisions throughout the life cycle? And then once it's launched, you know, sourcing, operations, end of life components, how do we manage those? Those are continual uh, project you know, tasks that we must continue to monitor over time. But the reality is once a customer gets to this point, they're leaning heavily on us to provide that for them. And that's where we like to uh, support the customer from the from scalability to cost management to cost control and cost erosion over time. And with that said, I'd like to hand this over to Rami to make a few comments. Thanks, Charlie. Um, okay. So requirements management, let's talk about that. Um, uh, you know, starting with collection of requirements, uh, you know, in this case, you know, we want to be able to collect requirements uh, from various stakeholders, including customers, their end customers, customers and project team members. Um, there's various methods for collecting requirements, uh, such as interviews, surveys, workshops, um, there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different insights to kind of gather that information. But the key point is to really kind of, um, you know, ask those questions to not take the requirements at surface value um, and really dig deeper into, um, you know, what the customer is asking you to build for them. Because uh, a lot of times there's opportunities to optimize, to cost reduce um, when, when you kind of ask those questions. Um, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, finally, in terms of, you know, collecting uh, the requirement collection process, uh, you know, can be, be made more efficient by prioritizing uh, requirements and focusing on the most critical ones. Um, in terms of structuring requirements, um, you know, we want to definitely structure requirements to help make them clear and concise and easier to understand for all stakeholders. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to, to document and structure the requirements um, using various approaches such as decomposition, categorization, and prioritization. And you know this is really important because well-structured um, requirements can help to ensure that everyone is on the same page and reduce the risk of misunderstanding and you know building something that the customer is not asking for. Um, classification of requirements. Um, this is important um, and is part of, falls under the category of prioritizing uh, requirements, ensuring that the most critical ones are addressed first. Uh, very often, uh, there's, you know, a timeline and a time pressure and um, a need to uh, launch a product or a service as soon as possible. And being able to identify an MVP or a most valuable, um, uh, min sorry, uh, being able to uh, um, identify a minimum viable product is critical to uh, you know being able to launch quickly um, and and you know beat the competition to the market and uh, uh, that classification uh, is critical uh, to that success um, and requirements can be classified based on a lot of different criteria some of them are business value technical complexity urgency um, and, and, you know, a proper classification can help project teams allocate resources effectively and plan for the most important work first. Um, moving into the um, uh, uh, assuring the consistency of requirements, there's a lot, of, a lot of times that we get requirements or project, uh, um, you know, requirement documents from customers where, uh, you know, overall the requirements are consistent, but you find some areas, some requirements where there's, an inconsistency or there's a conflict between requirements and you know this ensuring that you have um, consistency in the requirements is crucial for avoiding you know misunderstandings and assuring ensuring that all stakeholders have you know a shared understanding of the project goals and uh, you know inconsistencies and in requirements can arise from a lot of different sources some of them are conflicting stakeholder priorities or miscommunication a lot of the times it's not just one product person but uh, very often it's you know one product person or several product people who are talking to various stakeholders various customers various um, uh, various uh, uh, you know end customers at the market side uh, that are um, you know providing input on what a product or a service should look like and you, you eventually will end up with if the requirements are not um, 
you know, refined and, and um, reviewed properly, you'll, you'll end up with uh, um, inconsistent requirements. Um, in terms of prioritizing requirements, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's really a, a key to managing limited resources and making sure that the most important work is completed first. Um, uh, and, and we always go through a process on our side where we kind of have to define that MVP, that minimum viable product, because to complete everything, um, uh, all the features, all the requirements, all at once to launch a product will just take too long. And there's definitely a desire from all stakeholders involved, both on the Telet IoT solution side, as well as, uh, you know, the customer um, side to launch the product sooner rather than later so that that ROI can kick into place and, um, you know, be realized. So uh, proper prioritization can help, uh, you know, project teams deliver the most valuable work early um, and make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we're meeting stakeholder needs. Um, tracking requirements is, is an important part of requirements management. Um, uh, so tracking requirements is important to ensure that, you know, they are, it's, it's important to ensure that uh, you know, they're being met throughout the project and that any changes are identified and assessed um, immediately. Um, there's a lot of different tools that can be used. Um, uh, you know, you can use anything from spreadsheets to issue trackers um, for tracking requirements. Uh, the main thing is to track them in one fashion or another so that you always have that traceability. Um, and, you know, proper tracking can always, uh, you know, is, is going to be essentially the um, determining factor in, in helping teams, uh, you know, stay on top of requirements and make sure that they're delivering what's expected, where you already have that um, checklist. Because once you get into the weeds on a project, there's a lot of details, there's a lot of um, resolution handling that takes place, there's a lot of details, and I think the bigger picture can sometimes get missed, and having a, a proper issue tracker make sure that you know uh, everything that uh, has been committed to is actually being delivered to the customer. Uh, testing of the requirements. Um, testing the requirements is an essential part of ensuring that um, the requirements are met and that the final product meets stakeholder needs. Uh, so it's not enough to just design um, to a certain set of requirements, but testing them is really important as well. Um, there's a lot of different testing that can take place, functional testing, there's acceptance testing, there's uh, regulatory and certification type testing that we need to go through to be legal um, in various, uh, um, you know, countries, um, uh, locally and globally. Um, and, and uh, you know, designing for tests is a crucial part of uh, the testing uh, of the requirements and requirements management process. Um, and, you know, the testing is really what can help project teams identify and address issues related to requirements, um, you know, early in the project and reduce the risk of costly rework later on. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, um, you know, there's essentially a saying uh, that, um, or I guess a rule of thumb that you want to say is that, you know, the longer it takes to detect an issue or the farther along you are in a project before an issue is detected, um, the more costly it is. You always want to be able to kind of present uh, the solution or the service earlier on uh, many times iteratively so that every stage um, you're able to kind of test, verify, and demonstrate to the customer and make sure you have their sign off at every single stage. And that's part of the iterative process that you know Charlie was alluding to earlier where, you know, we ensure that we're building the product and the service um, that meets uh, a stakeholder um, needs and requirements. All right. Um, so what do you need to be kind of successful in enabling an IoT solution? There's definitely a core technology form factor that is, you know, a common denominator across many um, IoT solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of building blocks, like this slide indicates, um, where there's integration activities, there's activation, there's operation. Um, you have all these verticals that are common to many IoT deployments. Um, but are not necessarily um, the key 
uh, value proposition that a customer is bringing to the market. You need to have all these. These are the building blocks, but that's not necessarily what a customer is uh, or the market is purchasing. They're purchasing something very specific, a service that this product enables, but you need a lot of different building blocks to make the solution successful so you can provide a service to the customer. Um, and, you know, security is one of them. Uh, being able to have, um, you know, building blocks that are seamless, that are integrated across, uh, you know, the IoT um, functional group or uh, um, uh, uh, categories. Uh, so seamless security all the way from the module side um, to SIM connectivity to um, platform, that end-to-end -end security cycle. That's something that is critical and necessary for every IoT deployment but um, it's not exactly what you're selling to the customer. Um, integration, um, you wanna be able to have a seamless integration with um, uh, um, various IoT solutions, applications, services, um, and that's one of the things that we specialize in very well in the IoT solutions uh, business unit where we are experts at integrating with a lot of different services, whether you're working with us on the IoT cloud platform side or you have existing services or web applications, uh, that direct integration with AWS IoT, Microsoft Azure, um, TeleCloud Platform, any other web application or service, those are the things that you know we provide out of the box, seamless integration. We have a process to you know reduce your time to market there so that you don't you can focus on what's critical to your business and not necessarily have to focus on these key building blocks that we've spent a lot of time and invested a lot of energy in um, you know optimizing. Same thing with activation. Um, you know modules, connectivity, um, uh, security uh, credentials, things like that. Those are all preloaded at the module level. We have that, um, you know, you have a SIM connectivity platform. Everything is is end-to-end -end seamless. Uh, all you have to do is activate the product and you have, um, you know, top of the line, best security um, implemented on the product all the way from the module uh, going up to the cloud connectivity management um, and end-to-end uh, uh, um, uh, uh, -end solution activation there. Um, on the operations side, uh, you know, transport, communication, security, and connectivity life management, we provide all of those services remotely. Um, you're able to uh, have a secure connection, manage that connection, manage the security credentials on your device remotely, um, and you're able to kind of control uh, um, uh, the end-to-end the -end product life management and cycle um, uh, from uh, remotely from cloud platform without having to uh, go through any kind of uh, um, uh, you know costly RMAs recalls um, or having to open up any devices and do any doing any manual labor. And like we mentioned before, there's you know this core expertise um, uh, you know and and uh, um, you know, common technology form factor, it's required through most, if not all, IoT products. Um, whether your vertical is smart building and security, whether it's, you know, utilities, whether it's healthcare, um, whether it's telematics and tracking, whatever, you know, vertical you may be in, uh, you always have to have these building blocks that we described. And these can be, require a huge investment on a potentially small business or even a large business where, uh, uh, you know, the expertise might not be there, the teams may not be there to kind of invest and create these solutions. And working with the IoT solutions team, this is where you're able to kind of leverage, you know, the time and the expertise that we've put in to kind of master this, um, uh, um, you know, common form factor or technology form factor uh, so that you can rapidly deploy your solution and your business value add to the market without having to invest um, all the time and energy and money into uh, you know standing up these solutions that are critical to deploying an IoT product and you're able to kind of focus mainly on the things that are valuable to your business and and your vertical. Now getting into the details on the 
uh, Centurion on end-to-end -end service enablement. Um, one edge, this is where you kind of have a um, end-to-end solution integration uh, that covers security, connectivity, sim, uh, um, uh, provisioning. Uh, all of these things are baked in, um, leaving the factory, where all you have to do is uh, you know, turn on the device and everything is provisioned, everything is working as expected. You have security out of the box and it's it's something that, um, uh, you know, is, is you're getting from us as a solution provider where uh, this solution is rigorous. It's been tested, pen tested, um, has many uh, customers and, and has a large volume of deployment um, for the solution. And again, it starts, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's by design. It's not something that is happening after the fact where we're kind of sprinkling it in. Um, it's something that is baked in at the module level, um, at the application level, and going all the way into the cloud where you have that end-to-end -end, um, seamless provisioning out of the box. For Next and Next Plus, this is where you have um, the connectivity solution uh, part of the Telecenturion end-to-end enablement. Um, and again, um, this is where uh, SIM provisioning, a lot of complex tasks um, and security and provisioning tasks take place um, in this uh, um, space. And, and this all happens uh, out of the box where uh, you, know, you are able to, with the IoT solutions, next connectivity, um, uh, you're able to provision SIMs, manage your connectivity, um, enable, disable, activate, deactivate lines, uh, you know, manage your fleet remotely uh, uh, through the services that we provide. Uh, Device-wise uh, is, uh, you know, uh, a quick way for you to get onboarded, right? So if um, you want to do a, a POC, a proof of concept, you want to be able to demonstrate the value of a solution that you're providing. The DeviceWise cloud will allow your device uh, to connect to the platform uh, various, uh, through various uh, uh, um, technologies, MQTT, HTTP, lightweight m to m all secure, um, and will allow you to kind of manage and build on top of that web applications, integrate with third-party APIs and third-party applications as needed. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, at an enterprise level. And then I'll hand it back to you, Amanda. Great, thank you so much. Um, now, just before we get to our questions here, uh, audience, I am going to drop a poll on your screen. Um, if you'd like to have one of our experts contact you directly, um, or you have a really specific question you'd like us to address, please just respond here on the poll and we'll be sure to have someone reach out to you. Um, we do have time for a few questions and there is still time to ask a question. So please submit um, using the box near the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to cover it in the time we've got left here. Um, we have just a couple questions, so we'll dive right in. Um, the first question I have, how early in the customer engagement do you like to see these requirements conversations take place? Um. I can answer that one, Amanda, Charlie. Um, great question. I think that for our, from our perspective, we want to see that basically from the first time we talk to the customer, once we're understanding what kind of project or product they're trying to bring to the market, we want to understand all of the details that they may know at that point. So whether they have a complete PRD already available for us or if they just have a high-level overview, even if it's just a list of I need it to do X, Y, and Z. We want to discuss that from as early as possible. Um, certainly the way we go to market with customers is we will understand their requirement <clears throat> and put together a full proposal, which would encompass, you know, from the requirements they fed us, from what we know about what is required to be successful from an IoT solution perspective, uh, we'll put together that proposal to cover not only the timeline and the cost of the project, but we even estimate the per unit cost of the devices once they're in production. So 
the only way we can do that is if we're we know what those requirements are, we know what the customer's trying to get off of their edge device, if, if, you know, what sensor data they care about, what's actionable for them, the quicker and earlier we can know about those requirements, the more information we can give to a customer um, about the project and about the scope we would work with together. Great, thank you. Um, next question, what does a good handoff from sales to R&D or the project team look like? Um, I'll take that one, uh, Amanda, um, a good handoff from sales to R and D project team, uh, usually involves clear communication, um, of the customer's needs and expectations, uh, as well as, you know, any constraints or challenges that were identified during the sales process. Um, you know, this information should be documented in a clear and concise way. Um, and should include any relevant customer feedback or insights that were gathered during the sales process. Um, there's, there's usually a lot of uh, pain points, issues, insights, requirements that, you know, the customer, uh, is trying to resolve mm -hmm. with engaging us, uh, with this solution and capturing that up front, make sure that it's, you know, a high priority and has high visibility for us on the R and D side, uh, when we go into the execution and make sure that this is one of the requirements or the requirements that we're tracking to, um, yep. That's at a high level. Great, thanks, Romy. Um, and this next question is probably for you as well. Um, is there a project management methodology that's especially good at ensuring alignment throughout the project life cycle? There's a lot of different ways to manage um, uh, uh, projects, Amanda. Um, I would say the agile project management uh, methodology um, is particularly effective at, um, you know, ensuring alignment on requirements throughout the project life cycle. Um, and that's mainly because it's an ir it's ir iterative. Um, uh, um, and the iterative nature of Agile allows for that continuous feedback um, uh, mechanism and adaptation, ensuring that the project requirements are constantly being evaluated um, and adjusted as necessary. And so, uh, when we kind of think about, um, you know, uh, feature development and uh, providing continuous delivery on features, you want to be able to kind of, as you are developing each and every feature, you want to be able to put that in front of the customer, uh, have a demo of some sort where they're able to better understand and visualize and see and experience uh, what that feature is, is you know, what, what that feature is providing them. Because very often, like Charlie alluded to earlier um, in his presentation, um, uh, very often there's, a, uh, there's sometimes a miscommunication or a mismatch in understanding, or sometimes once the you know, customer gets what they think they wanted, they realize that, hey, this actually doesn't meet a lot of different requirements that we have, or we didn't imagine that it would, um, you know, that this is what the behavior would look like. And so for whatever reason, um, that iterative nature helps us capture um, uh, you know an issue or identify an issue in the requirements uh, early on and helps us correct course uh, very early in the project design cycle where it's very cost effective or low cost to make changes uh, so that's that's kind of the process that we try to um, follow internally we try to present as early and as quickly as possible features have demos give the customer an opportunity to you know, um, exercise the feature, experience it, get hands on with it, because they won't really fully understand, um, you know, what this feature is and how um, it plays out in the field and in the context of their business requirements until you give them an opportunity to test it out um, and, and deploy it. Great. Thanks, Rami. Um, next question I've gotten here. Um, what types of certification services do you offer? I can take that one, Amanda. Um, so uh, it's a very simple answer. Um, we, we do everything for the customer. So depending on where they're launching, uh, you know, which is why this, you know, engagement and alignment on requirements and markets are important because um, we do everything based on where they need to launch it. So that's everything from, you know, typical certification for regulatory compliance from a wireless perspective to UL safety or EU safety, uh, 
depending on where they're trying to launch the product. Uh, customers don't need to be experts there. We do sometimes ask for guidance from them on their particular vertical, uh, if there's something unique to their vertical that we need to address. But otherwise, we work with you know all of the lab partners uh, available in the market across all the continents uh, to meet the needs of our customers so that they don't have to worry about being compliant. Um, you know, Partners work with us from an IoT solutions perspective because they, they want to get to the finish line. They want to have it done the right way. And for us, that includes certification. So when a customer engages with us on a project, they can rest assured that the product will be compliant, uh, it, regulatory. They'll be able to import it from you know, any geographical region uh, based on those requirements. Uh, and then we you know, keep that up to date. So uh, as most of our audience knows, uh, many times uh, certifications can expire. Uh, we work uh, proactively on the customer's behalf to keep those up to date to make sure that their business continuity is not interrupted. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I believe that is all the time that we have for today. Um, audience, please be sure to check your inboxes in the coming days for that replay link. Um, again, there are some additional resources here for you to check out um, if you are looking for more information. Um, Charlie, Rami, thank you so much for your time today, and thank you, everybody who joined us.